Hello and welcome, Mary Lattimore. We're so excited to have you here today. It's such a pleasure to be talking with you. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> so Mary Lattimore is a harpist based out of LA. And Mary, the first thing I'd like to ask you is, could you give us a background on your role in the industry? What is it that you do and how did you get into it? Um, I am a harpist and I, uh, I started out as a classical musician. I was trained classically, so I went to conservatory and stuff. But um, at this point, I'm mainly playing sort of improvised music, uh, writing, writing songs also and recording them. And then also I'm playing parts on other people's records, um, sort of getting into film scoring too, and just trying to bring the harp um, to a wider audience. Uh, my mom is a harpist, so I started off when I was age 11 learning um, from her and some of her harpist friends. Um, so I've been playing the harp a really long time, but my mom has been my, wow. my main influence uh, as far as that goes. I read, actually, on that note, I read somewhere that you weren't keen on the harp at first. <laughs> um, I was wondering is there a specific event that that turned that around or or um, what was the turning point there i think uh yeah when you're 11 you don't want to sit down and practice so much i think it's like you know my mom especially being someone that wanted me to sit down and be very focused and serious for hours at a time because she just wanted me to love the harp so much she was like really trying <laughs> to love it so she's like just play more and then you'll love it more but for me, I think, um, you know, having to sit down as an 11 year old child and concentrate for so long, that was the part where I was like, no, I don't want to, like, none of my friends have to sit down and, <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. So I was a little bit uh, cranky about having to practice so much, but what turned it around, I guess, was actually getting better at it. So you know, I, it was uh, it was more fun to play the better I got and the more advanced the music got and then the more people wanted to hear me play. I liked playing for people and just thinking that I was good at something, you know? Just, I feel like um, it, the practicing really paid off and that it, help, it really helped my self-esteem to be like good at something. <laughs> for sure. And you were 11 when you started. What age did you feel that you were starting to to get better uh, and starting to enjoy it? Maybe when I was like 15 or 16. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I did enjoy it. I, uh, I enjoyed learning. I really did. Um, but I started to get better when I was 15 or 16, like learning substantial repertoire and then asking to, um, are people asking me to play at weddings and um, coming to hear my recitals and things like that. You know, just feeling really encouraged at getting better at it and finding my own, my own voice. voice right. So you play a specialty instrument. This isn't maybe an instrument that everybody would gravitate to. I mean, when you're first starting out, maybe it's singing or playing guitar, but this is something totally outside the realm of what most people think of. So are there some disadvantages or maybe advantages to being a, a person who plays a specialty instrument in the music world today? Well, I think if I play guitar, then I wouldn't have as many opportunities, honestly. I think the fact that I do play kind of a weird instrument um, has has made it like a niche kind of instrument has made it so that I'm able to um, to like be an advocate for the instrument and try to, to slip it into places where I might not otherwise have the opportunity. Um, you know, I'm like, well, why don't you try a harp with your song or something? You know, <laughs> I like I I am a real advocate for the harp, and um, you know, it might not be such an obvious thing to include in things. But uh, if I had played something that was more common, I don't think that I would just be as um, as much of a cheerleader for the instrument itself. You know, right? And somebody... on that note. Sorry, Maddie, oh, sorry, Jerry, go ahead. <laughs> um, on that note, the harp being a specialty instrument, it's obviously not, um, is, is there different things that go into how it works? Maybe can you give us a little bit of a background on what a harp is, how it works, maybe even how it's tuned because it's, it's a little bit different from playing guitar or a bass. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of like a piano. It's laid out in the chromatic scale. Um, like, uh, there's, on my harp, there are seven pedals. There's a pedal, a C pedal, D pedal, E pedal, F, G, A, and B. And each pedal has three notches. So it has a flat, natural, and sharp. So there's lots of um, chordal combinations that you can make, but it's basically like a piano. If you have all the pedals set to natural, then um, it's like a C major scale. And the harp is color coded. So it has 47 strings, but you can tell um, what the notes are, like where's the C, you know, where's the middle C? Well, it's the, it's a red string. So the C's are red and the, um, the F's are blue, bluish black. And so then that's how you know the notes in between C and F, like D and E, you know them by relativity, relativeness to this, the C and the F. So it's kind of laid out just like a piano, but just, um, you know, upright. <laughs> I just, this question just popped into my head, but what are the strings made out of? Are they, are they like nylon strings or are they? Yeah, the bass strings are made out of wire. So there's, they're wound wire and they're really resonant. Um, the middle strings can be made out of nylon or else gut, I guess it's yeah. cow gut, you know, they use mm -hmm. gut for some strings, not, not vegan. Not a vegan. <laughs> um, and then um, nylon at the top. So that's how my harp is strong. I see. How can a, how can somebody get into playing the harp? How, how can they even access one? Where what advice can you give to somebody that wants to get started on that instrument? Mm -hmm. Well, um, there are different rent to own programs from the uh, from harp companies. So you can start off on a full harp, which you, which isn't terribly expensive, but if you don't want to invest in buying one right away, then you can rent to own it, um, where you just pay a certain amount of money per month. And then at the end of you paying for it all, you own it or else, you know, you figure out after a couple months that harp isn't really your thing and then mm -hmm. you can um, give it back. But there's that, but then there are like folk harps online that you can buy like kits I've seen like little kits that you can make you can put the harp together yourself um, it all depends on what you're going to really use it for like if you want to use it as a stepping stone to get into the concert harp then um, maybe you, you wouldn't start necessarily with like a kit but if you if you were just using it to make textural sounds for your band or if you're just like using it to um, help you like meditate or something something like that then those kits are pretty cool um there's a brand called harpsicle which is like a real beginner harp and i've seen it with a lot of children like a lot of children play this harp called the harpsicle and it's very cute it comes in little different colors and <laughs> um right now it seems like a lot of harpists are doing lessons on on zoom you know um and so, I was gonna ask. I was gonna ask you about that. Do you currently teach? I don't right now, um, but I have in the past, and I have loved teaching. I I probably should get started with it again because Zoom makes it so easy. But um, my touring schedule in real life uh, doesn't allow me to really have students on the regular, you know. And like, I guess that's part of the the. Um, the importance of being a teacher is to be available on a regular basis for your students. So I could do it right now, but, um, but in, my reg when, in my normal life, I'm really not able to because of my schedule. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned that you tour. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask what, maybe what kind of that looks like for you or what career opportunities or gig opportunities are available to you? Well, I, um, for the past couple of years, I've been touring as a solo artist. So I, I have a Volvo, like an SUV style car and my harp goes in the back and then I just get in the car and I drive. Um, I've been, you know, crisscrossing the country a couple times a year um, on tour uh, and in Europe and Asia and Australia and stuff too. So. Touring here wow. is me in my car, but touring abroad is a lot of like 
renting harps and figuring out that logistically. So that's a little bit tricky, but um, as far as here goes, I, I really like the self-sufficiency and the, uh, the independence of driving it myself. But yeah, just mainly like playing solo shows and um, just, you know, just being on the roads. <laughs> So you plan, do you plan your own shows when you go on tour? You kind of, um, what venues or, or places usually cater to your style of music? I have a, I have booking agents. And so my oh. US booking agent books me like, you know, I play rock clubs, but then I also play churches, like beautiful cathedrals or really cool music festivals. Or I found that I can kind of fit in because I don't, I'm not really in a real genre that's very um, rigid, then I can kind of fit in with a lot of different genres and a lot of different styles of other musicians. So that makes it really fun. But yeah, I have this booking agent who really understands me. He's also a great friend and uh, he here and he, he finds me the shows and books it all for me. Awesome. I know you've uh, written and released, of course, a lot of your own work and collaborated with many other artists. Um, do you do a lot of session work, like not not collaborations necessarily, but mm -hmm. but but studio session work? Yeah. You must be, I mean, of course, being specialized. And how do they find you? Um, just through Instagram or word of mouth, friends of friends, things like that, or else it has happened where sometimes I'll be a fan and I'll be like, if you ever need harp, let me know, you know, and that'll be like a cool opportunity to kind of fit into the music that I like to listen to. Um, what else? I, I mean, I have a website and my label that puts out my stuff, Ghostly, Ghostly International, they um, have, you know, I feel like they are a good uh, advocate for me and have made my, um, my music pretty public out there, so. I think that's a great thing that you said about um, being a little proactive about offering, you know, offering to 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 collaborate. Um, how do you find the artists um, that you have collaborated with before? Are these, these people that you gig with or did you meet online or I bet you must be different every time. But generally, how do you find who you want to collaborate with? Mostly it's friends. So if uh I don't know, for example, like I've played with Kurt Vile a bunch and been on his records and stuff and he was just a neighbor of mine in Philadelphia. Or um, Meg Baird is a very close friend of mine. She and I made a duo record uh, two years ago and we had just been friends for many years and it was just a matter of time before we collaborated. Um, I have a friend, Juliana Barwick, who's a very beautiful musician and I was a fan of her. So I wrote her an email and I was like, I love your music would love to collaborate with you sometime. And when she came through Philadelphia, where I used to live, um, she and I hung out and then we really hit it off. And now we both live in LA and we hang out all the time and go on tour together and stuff. So it's really fun. I think just being open to saying yes and, and just like having that little spark in your mind that's like, oh, this would be interesting. You know, that curiosity about what your instrument would sound like with someone else's um, specialty. Yeah, music is so have, personal. Have you found, uh, speaking of your move there, have you found um, that that things are, look a lot different for you in LA than than on the East Coast? Are there a lot? Are there more opportunities? Hmm. Or what sparked the move? Maybe I should ask. I think yeah, looking for more opportunities, and also I just like to move. Like I feel like I uh, I lived there for thirteen years in Philadelphia, and I just needed a change. And it's so cold. I think also like wheeling the harp down the icy sidewalk is really scary. And I did it for so long that like just the idea of not being limited by the weather was really appealing to me, you know? Um, and like here it's, you know, I'm like wearing short sleeves. It's like really <laughs> kind of the same all year round. And, and that, that way, like in normal times, I could do session work all year round or play shows here you know, without having to worry about um, endangering my instrument by just transporting it, you know? That's a great logistical point, actually. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Mm. So switching gears a little bit, also, um, I, I read a little bit that 
you work on soundtracks sometimes and um, are a little bit into film scoring. So how do you seek out projects like that? And what is the process of writing for a soundtrack? Well, I have not officially um, written a score yet, but that's what I'm trying to do now. Um, I have played, uh, played on scores that other people have written. So I have a lot of composer friends who are writing for, um, who are writing for movie sound movie scores. And I've played the heart parts on those. And then I've also done a, a couple of um, uh, scores for silent films. So that's, that's what I've done, like live scoring, where, um, you know, a, a couple friends and I have sat down with a silent film and then thought of music to put with it and then perform that live with the special oh, wow. film. Cool. Um, yeah, really fun. So like that kind of, you know, you kind of have to get into that mindset of like, okay, following what's happening, watching the movie a couple times, figuring out themes, like figuring out um, instrumentation and how to make it kind of diverse throughout. So if it's a two hour movie or something, your music doesn't sound totally the same the mm -hmm. whole time. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited to someday be asked to score a film you know, basically from living here in LA, like, I think hopefully it's only a matter of time before someone finds me and wants me to score their film. <laughs> <laughs> What's the process of, what would be your advice to young artists seeking out um, film scoring? What, is it about networking? What's the process of, of getting involved with these films? I don't know, I think like, I think maybe, um, you know, finding a filmmaker that is also a young artist, you know, and like maybe collaborating, working together and trying to, um, to figure out what kind of music would go well, like kind of learning together. That would be my, my <laughs> advice to a young harpist or a young musician who wants to find um, those kind of opportunities, like go, go to find a film school student, like a filmmaker student and then offer to make something for them for free and so then you guys are both learning how at the same time how to do it for me um I didn't focus on that as as a student so I kind of regret that um at this point um yeah I don't know <laughs> I'm just hoping for for good luck and and um getting the opportunity but I wish that I had had really approached other students to kind of learn that. The visual aspect to some of your work is very cool and it plays a, a big role. Um, and you mentioned earlier that you improvise a lot of music on the harp. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, when, when you're improvising, do you have a visual aspect to what you're playing or do you have something in mind? Is that involved in, in any of your process at all? Yeah, always. You know, the, the songs always, even though there aren't words, there is always some kind of like little memory or little movie in my mind that I'm, I'm writing about. So, you know, some like heartbreak or some kind of move or some kind of nostalgic, like haunting memory or a pet who's died or something like that, you know, that's, that's, I'm kind of memorializing or, um, you know, trying to make a scrapbook of, of memories and people and places and stuff with the music. So, mm -hmm. but I don't, I mean, thinking about the listener, I, I don't like expect the listener to truly get it because there's no words, you know, the only indication of what it might be about is the title. So mm -hmm. it really, I think it's cool how also people can take it where they want to take it. You know, you can make up your own little story about the songs, but um, yeah, it's, it's inspirationally, there's always something that I'm writing about in general. That's really interesting. I think there's a lot of young musicians that aren't necessarily uh, songwriters or lyricists uh, and they're instrumentalists. And, you know, I don't always think that they think that they can compose or that, that you know, um, they always think, or, you know, young people might think that a song has to have words and it has to have a structure. And what sort of advice could you give to young instrumentalists on composing a piece? Mm -hmm. 
um, so that it feels complete and is, you know, satisfying to do. I think, yeah, just come up with a mental painting or some mental picture that, that you, that inspires some kind of feeling in you. I don't know. I, I am personally, I'm not a person that just makes music based on textures and technology and like, um, and sound. I always, I'm a pretty emotional person in a way. So I like to rely on that kind of um, momentum, like emotional feeling to write the song. So if you are that kind of person that isn't just kind of fascinated by the, um, the sound waves and all that, you know, or this, this, like the sound and you want to inject some, re something really like, emotional in there then maybe just sit down with with a memory that you might have that's really strong and see what you come up with hmm. um that's that's my advice that's really good advice thank you for expressing that mm -hmm. i'd also like to ask maybe what are some of your favorite projects that you've been a part of or maybe favorite shows that you've had that you've played um oh i played recently in March, I played in Canada and um, I went to Victoria for the first time. Oh, nice. Rode, yeah, I rode the ferry and uh, with my friend Francis Quinlan, we were on tour together and the two of us went and played in Victoria and that was really lovely, just like seeing that part of the world I love. Um, and um, one of the, uh, I guess my newest record, Silver Ladders, I made it last year in um, January in Cornwall. And that was a situation where I was a big fan of this band Slow Dive and the, the singer, one of the singers for Slow Dive, I just had this idea that I wanted him to produce my next record. And so I, I talked to him and I flew to Cornwall in the UK and we made this record together. So I would count that as a very um, powerful and fun and inspirational, inspiring, um, event in my heart career where I just flew to this this place I'd never been before playing a harp I'd never played before and meeting this guy that I didn't really know but I just loved his music so much and like just trying to um have a brand new experience where my senses were really turned on and I was really able to absorb and translate that into music I think that was really fun great very cool mm -hmm. That's very awesome. cool. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for sharing all of this experience and advice with us. It's amazing. I, I'd like to ask you one more thing. Um, we usually end our podcast like this. We ask all of our guests, what would be your advice to uh, young artists or maybe even your advice to your past self? Hmm. <laughs> I, um, hmm. I guess I would say, like, don't let your inner critic really rule your life you know like a, for a long time as a classical musician I separated the music that I like to listen to and shows I like to go to um from myself my harp self you know who could play this instrument and I separated them and my inner critic was like no your ideas are bad just play what's on the page play the classical music you're good at it like just play what's written on the page um, and my, my inner critic was just like, you're, you know, it's scary to play what's not on the page. Like, what if you sound dorky, you know, <laughs> like, I, I think just like trying to, um, trying to stamp out that part of your brain that tells you that you're dorky <laughs> or something in music or, or that you aren't as cool as other people are like, or, or that you're. Um, that your ideas aren't aren't valid or you're experimenting with music isn't interesting enough or or whatever like I feel like you are your own worst enemy in in like uh, in music sometimes and I think yeah just figuring out how to to quiet that that voice is really important and anything you do is gonna sound really really cool just keep um keep being curious and trying stuff out and um, 
even if it sounds primitive, it would it still sounds really cool. Sometimes I think that the the coolest music is the most primitive, where you don't know how to play the instrument so well, and you're just trying things out. And that kind of naivete is like really, um, it can be really special sometimes, you know. Very well wow. said. I I totally hear everything you just said. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Mary. We appreciate your time. Yeah, my my pleasure. Have a nice it's so time. much fun. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we we'll hope to see you again. Yeah, you too. Thank you.